technology. Good morning, Bowman Church. As you've probably already surmised, we've had a, another morning of technological difficulties. You live or you die by your technology, but I personally, that's right, that's right. <laughs> Thank you, that's a correction right there. Um, yeah, the church for most of its existence didn't have speakers, didn't have projectors, didn't have buildings, didn't have air conditioning, and so I'm trying to remind myself of that this morning while I'm look, staring at this computer that when I last left it was configured correctly, and now it isn't. But yeah, Blackboard. <laughs> yeah, this is still our father's world, and so we continue on forward. Uh, the typical housekeeping, you've got some cards in front of you. I think we're running low on a couple chairs, but there are spread out plenty of them. You have encouragement cards because we all love unexpected words of encouragement from each other. There are connect cards for you to share your information so we can establish a relationship. Or if you're moving, that's the medium through which you can share that. But most importantly is the prayer card. And please, everyone, take a prayer card out and write Bowman Community Church Technological Systems that they would be brought into full obedience. <laughs> so, please, uh, but seriously, prayer in the good and the bad, in the thick and thin, is crucial. Whether it's for God's provision and deliverance in a trial, or if it's for God's to keep you humble, keep you mindful of Him in plenty, both of them equally important. There is one thing that I was requested, requested to pray about, and that would be um, Barbara Burlingham has had some um, body pain recently, and so uh, we're going to pray for her first before we prepare ourselves for worship and music. So let's pray together. Lord, we lift this dear sister up to you for healing, if it be your will, and we trust that whatever is to happen in this dear sister in Christ's life, that it would be ultimately for her perfect good and her perfect blessing. We lift her up this morning, but we do pray much like children lord take this from her heal her uh, restore her to full health lord we praise you this morning thank you for all of the gifts you've given to us and all of the complications that come with them we know that your hand is at work not only in the gift but in the complications and lord there are gifts and there are complications this morning far far bigger than bowman's technological systems and with those in mind and the hope that we have within us we say amen yes and amen why is it my technological screen coming on <laughs> good morning there that we go this time very good lisa good job <laughs> look we have lisa on the platform this week I'm running in and yeah. across here. I didn't even notice. <laughs> all the time. She was there all the time. Oh. That's what they were applauding. Oh, okay. I thought it was the techno technological failure. So there's an old te testament scripture, uh, Chronicles, first Chronicles 29:11 that uh, Tracy is going to exuberantly read for you. Yes, my husband has me speaking yet again. <laughs> so it's First Chronicles 29, 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Above all. Thank you, Lord. That introduces us to the first song called Great is the Lord. Stand with us, yes. Here we go. Praise the Lord, He is holy and just. By His power we trust. Faithful and true, by his mercy he proves his love. 
Thank you, Father, that we can find our rest in you. It doesn't lie anywhere else. Amen. Brother, uh, Pastor Mark. Brother Mark, Pastor Mark. Brother slash Pastor Mark. It all works. <laughs> So this morning, first of all, I got to say, we were unable to get the sound working upstairs. I don't know. No one's even here. We, how? I mean, I didn't fall about it, right? <laughs> and I know of. We're going to introduce some members today. And what a delight it is. So Linda, Bonnie, Daryl, don't all get up at once. Um... Always delighted to have new members come because we're running a little bit behind. I'm not going to go into it as much, but um, essentially they're saying um, this is our family, and that's always a delight. And we're saying complicitly that uh, we're their family, and uh, they're saying they're going to serve here, and we're saying we're going to serve with them. And so uh, it's just a delight. It seems like the Lord always brings us his choice as saints and so again it's a de delight to have them so you guys come and t give us your testimony it doesn't have to be long but we want to hear about your salvation months old until I was seven. I lived with my grandparents. They were very devout Christians. And every time the church door was open, we were there. One Sunday, when I was five years old, I was laying in the pew, front pew of a little country church. And the preacher told the story of Jesus as crucifixion. And how they put a crown on the kids in his head. And how they nailed them to his feet and hands. I began to cry out loud. <laughs> Grandmother came running up to see what was wrong. And there she led me to ask Jesus into my heart. God has been with me to my life through two broken homes and several foster homes. He's kept me in his church. When I lived with somebody who did not go to church, members of a local church would come pick me up and take me to church. Dear friends, this I know, that I, with body and soul, both in life and in death, am not my own but I belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood has saved me, has satisfied for all my sins. For I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives within me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who died and gave himself for me. He loved me and gave himself for me. Um, Galatians 2.20. Dear church, Jesus said, I was a stranger and you took me in. Yeah. That's exactly what this church has done for Imogene, Linda, and myself. And I thank you. And may God richly bless you for it. Thank you very much. Yeah. By the way, Bonnie supplies the flowers every Sunday. Yeah, yeah. we really appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you preach, you know. <laughs> That's not going to happen. I'm Linda Richards, and. Uh, to say it's been a roller coaster ride is kind of an understatement. 
I, I believed in God. When I was little, we went to church, and then the family broke up. It, it was just, well, a strange life. And I got to the point where I thought I had control over what happened. I still knew there was a God. I still knew that Jesus had died on the cross, but I thought I had control. Well, I have control of absolutely nothing. It took me years to finally come to that realization. But I believe in God. I believe in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for my sins. I, I can't fathom him dying for my sins, as great as they are, but he died for the whole world. And I have to, I have to say that Jesus is the love of my life. He has saved me. And I want to thank Bowman Church also because you have helped me on that walk. I, I, I believe in God, the maker of all things. I mean, how anybody cannot believe is just beyond me. I believe in Jesus Christ, the greatest gift that was ever given. And all we have to do is just hold out our hand and say yes. I, I want to thank Bowman Church and try to keep me on the straight and narrow, guys. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> works cut out for us, huh? <laughs> so, well, I, Mark said I had 30 minutes, so. Uh, <laughs> no, not, not really. Uh, I came, uh, really came to know the Lord in the, in the mid-80s, but I look back at my life and like somebody else, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Um, I can remember as a little kid, my grandma, Kelly, put me on her lap and read scripture to me. I went a lot of years thinking that I knew what the scripture said and. I knew that God existed, and I knew that Christ died for us, uh, only because of the Christmas story and the Easter story and all of that. I, I knew that, but in the mid-'80s, I realized one night that uh, I'm one of those sinners that it talks about in the Bible, and Christ died for me. I love Christ with all my heart. I can't say much more. I, just, I love this church. And I want to thank everybody for just accepting me for who I am. And uh, I love God. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to pray first, but uh, again, just thank you for your testimonies. Um, uh, just, I, I, you guys all did just, uh, you, you did us a service by encouraging us. Uh, um, it's always encouraging to hear about someone else's trail of grace, you know, how the Lord got us to himself. So let's pray. Father God, thank you for these guys. Thank you for bringing them into our family. Father, we pray that you would bless them, enable them to uh, flourish here at Bowman. Um, thank you for the, the ways they're already serving you here in this church. Father, we pray that you would just continue to bless them. Um, you know what you have in store for them. Uh, every step of the way has been scripted so that ultimately they will... Um, they will thrive. We thank you for this. Father, we pray that you would just continue to watch over them as you brought them into our family. Thank you for their testimonies. Thank you for the encouragement that it's been to all of us to hear how you brought them to yourself. Perhaps there's someone here today who's listened to this, said, you know, that, 
I get it, but I've never turned and trusted. May today be their day of salvation. And then finally, Father, um, help us as a church to just continue to come alongside them and, and, and encourage them. Help us to be a unified, loving family, an expression of the kingdom of God, passionate about helping others come to know the Savior the same way these guys know the Savior. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Lord bless. Thank you. We're so happy. We love you guys. Thank you for being. Um, so I'm just going to briefly go over this catechism question. And the temptation is to say, all right, we're going to do it next week. The problem is everything is kind of scripted months ahead. And so we're, I'm just going to quickly go over this question rather than uh, disrupt our, our pattern. It's pretty bad when a little church like this has a pattern that we're sticking to, right? We're not very flexible. So question five, this is from Keech's Catechism. And again, I just want to make sure that we're grounded in uh, theological truth. How do we know that the Bible is the word of God? And the answer is, the Bible evidences itself to be God's word by the heavenliness of its doctrine. It's about eternal life. It's about God. The unity of its parts. It's so amazing to me how uh, the word of God fits together. Um, a document from a human's perspective that was written by many different individuals over a thousand years, over a thousand years. And yet it's all saying the same thing. It's power to convert sinners and edify saints. We've just had uh, evidence of this. Convert sinners, evidence saints. But only the Spirit of God can make us willing to agree and submit to the Bible as the Word of God. Ultimately, if we're going to see the Bible as the Word of God, God has to move and work in our lives. Yeah. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for uh, bringing us here today. Thank you, Father, for the ways that uh, you've encouraged us in the truth of the gospel. Uh, it's just amazing truth that we have everlasting life, not as we keep the law, but, Father, as we trust Jesus. But we're saved by grace through faith. Father, we thank you so very much for this truth. Our sin is forgiven and Christ's righteousness is imputed, is credited to our account. Father, we thank you for this, glory, this great and glorious truth. Um, Father, we come before you as broken people, as sinful people, and so we confess our sin. We understand that we're great sinners. Um, we've broken your law. We understand that breaking one law breaks the whole law, but we've probably done our share in breaking many uh, uh, commands that are found in your word. We confess our sin and Father, we realize that our sin is forgiven through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, not only do we confess our sin, but we have the assurance that we have everlasting life because Jesus bore our sin on the cross. Thank you for this truth. We pray that you would encourage us with this truth as we move through the service. As always, Father, we, we pray for us as a church. Help us to be a faithful church. Um, thank you for the saints who are part of this church. Um, thank you for bringing us together. I, I, we, we pray that um, uh, you would just continue to bless us. Thank you for the saints who serve you here. Thank you for the financial gifts that keep us going. We pray that you would bless gift and giver. Father, we again pray that you would help us to, to stay on track spiritually. Help us to always be about making disciples, ultimately building your kingdom. Help us to be faithful. And uh, Father, we also pray that you would help us to tend our relationships with each other. Uh, we realize that a right relationship with you expresses itself in a right relationship with our brothers and sisters. Father, we pray for your church, your corporate church. We pray for your church around the world. We pray that it would be faithful. And uh, Father, we pray for the many lost. We ask that you would draw them to yourself. We pray for our country. Father, we ask that you would graciously bless our country, bless our leaders. And they enable them to make wise, righteous decisions. We pray for our election coming up. We pray that you would give us great leaders. Father, we pray for the, the situation regarding COVID. We pray that it would go away. Father, we pray that you would keep us as a church healthy. We ask that those who are ill, that you would heal them. Those who have lost loved ones, we pray that you would put them back together. 
that you would give them peace. Father, we uh, pray that um, you would, uh, actually, shifting gears a bit, we, we bring our own requests to you, Father. We ask that you would move and work in relation to those issues that we're dealing with, whether they're financial or relational. Father, um, health, we ask that you would bless. We pray that you would move and work. Be with our families, be with those who are single, watch over them and their needs. We pray for our marriages, keep them strong. Father, we pray for our children, cause them to come to know you at an early age and keep them running after you during their entire lives. And for those kids who have wandered from the faith, Father, we pray that you would graciously draw them back to yourself. Father, we pray for uh, Tom and Katie, our, our Kathy, rather, our village missionaries, Mingo, Kansas, bless their ministry. Um, keep them faithful, bless that faithfulness. And then we pray for Gospel for Asia, the, uh, the, the ministry that we're highlighting this month. Bless this ministry, Father. And uh, we pray that you would keep it faithful and that you would bless that faithfulness. Our prayer family, Gail Smith, bless Gail. Thank you for, again, bringing her into our family. We pray that you would enable her to thrive. Uh, Father, several cards this morning, uh, 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 encouragement cards. Um, for the piano playing, uh, for worship team, worship workers, um, the technicians. Uh, Father, uh, request that you be exalted. We say amen. Father, we pray that you would, would bless. Um, and then, Father, we um, Art and Marie's card, um, repentance and acceptance of salvation for, for Lonnie and Tim. Father, we pray that you would move work and open hearts. Uh, draw them to yourself. Uh, Linda's request. Uh, for her grandson, Derek, car accident, brain trauma, may lose an eye, uh, also an addict. Father, we pray you would put him back together physically, but more importantly, we pray for his salvation. And then, Father, we uh, pray for Betty Munson. We pray that she be able to get off, off oxygen. Um, also says for techno equipment. Father, we pray that you would bless in this situation. And then uh, we continue to pray for... Um, Andy and Marta's uh, relations, uh, Wesley and Carmen, draw them to yourself. You are the mighty God, open eyes. Father, we pray for Rhonda, who is battling cancer. We pray that you touch her body and heal her. And then uh, Bonnie's request, the salvation of my daughter and son-in-law, um, Kayla and Blake. You are the mighty God, Father. You have your own ways. We pray that you would open eyes. And then, Father, um, Sarah, uh, uh, it will be having knee replacement surgery on August 25th. Father, we pray that it all goes well. And then for the folks that we remember every Sunday, we think of Bill and Linda and Tom and Paul and Dean and Sue and Nancy, Kim's dad Floyd, Wendy, Bob, Doug, and no doubt there are others. We ask that you would bless and that you would heal. Uh, we pray for caregivers, give them energy and patience. Um, Father, we pray for the abortion issue in our country. We pray that you would change hearts, and uh, ultimately we would also request better laws. But most importantly, Father, we pray for changed hearts. And then we pray for the persecuted church. Be with those dear saints who pay a price for their faith. Watch over them. Keep them safe. Keep their families safe, not only physically but also spiritually. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. by how wonderful it is to have babies in this church. Yeah, we prayed great. for this for so long. Yeah. It's wonderful. <laughs> I love it. Let them scream. That's a praise to the Lord. That's right. We love it. <laughs> oh. <sighs> Give thanks.
Lord, we're so thankful to you. Father, you're so glorious. You're so strong in your grace and your mercy towards us, Father. And when we're weak, you're strong. So we proclaim it. We're strong. We're rich. Amen? Thank you, Lord. His mercies are newer. His love endures forever. We could go on and on. There's a fountain. There's a fountain filled with blood. Great communion song. Father, for your fountain, 
Please stand with us as we thank Jesus even further. Jesus, thank you. Jesus, 
Thank you, Father, for our lives. Thank you, Father. Please remain standing. Brother Scott is going to come up and read from God's Word. Good morning. Again, to, uh, it's my pleasure again to read for you as we work our way through the book of 2 Corinthians. We are in chapter 12, verses 11 through 21. I have been a fool. You forced me to it, for I ought to have been commended by you. For I was not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I am nothing. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you, with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. For in what were you less favored than the rest of the churches, except that I myself did not burden you? Forgive me this wrong. Here, for the third time, I am ready to come to you, and I will not be a burden, for I seek what is yours but you. For children are not obligated to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? But granting that I myself did not burden you, I was crafty, you say, and got the better of you by deceit. Did I take advantage of you, though any of those whom I sent you, through any of those whom I sent you? I urged Titus to go and sent the brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Did we not act in the same spirit? Did we, did we not take the same steps? Have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? It is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ and all for your upbuilding, beloved. For I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish and that you may find me not as you wish. Perhaps there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you and I may have to mourn over many of those who sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual immorality, and sensuality that they have practiced. May the Lord bless us with the reading of his word and take a moment to safely greet one another. All right, gang. All right. All right, 
Does everyone have the communion cup? I mean, their cups are out here in the foyer. It's your last chance. Okay, let's pray. Father God, uh, thank you for bringing us here today. Uh, Thank you for your work in our lives. Father, we pray that you would bless this time. Use your word and spirit to speak to us. You know what we need to hear. Give us ears to hear it. Uh, Father, we pray that in the end, uh, you would be honored and glorified. And because you're honored and glorified, um, we'll be encouraged. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. We're continuing our travels uh, through the book of Matthew. And... uh, Again, we're in Matthew 18. I'm going to read the text that we looked at last week and then go um, further into the text. So Matthew chapter 18, starting at verse 1, I'm going to go to verse 14. Matthew 18, verses 1 through 14. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Verse 7, what are the world for temptations? To, excuse me, woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes and be thrown into the hell of fire. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in and search for the one that went astray? And if he finds it truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. We come to a passage that, uh, that's somewhat difficult to understand. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you right ahead, uh, before I get there, verse 10 Whatever's going on there, I'm not exactly sure as far as the the angels in heaven are concerned. The first four verses are clear. We understand. Of course, we looked at these verses last week. Uh, Those who are great in the kingdom of heaven are those who are humble like a child. Humble like a child. Those, uh, he's talking about those who aren't concerned with status. And again, this is what we talked about last week. Aren't concerned about their reputation. Aren't concerned about being uh, considered great. Now, I love this personally. This is great truth, don't you think? Uh, All we need to do is recognize that we are who we are solely by God's grace. God has been gracious to us. Um, We have absolutely no reason to be proud. It's all a gift. And as we come as a child, as we come as a humble child, ultimately it impacts us, uh, obviously in major ways, But it's that person, it's those people who are great. As I said last week, it's not missionaries or pastors or authors or, you know, whomever. It's those ultimately who are humble, who come as children. Unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child, he had a child in front of him, this... uh, excuse me, like this child, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What's your greatest strength? Obviously, it's rhetorical, but hopefully something jumps into our heads. Remember, it's a gift. The next 10 verses are connected with these first four verses. These 14 verses all go together. That doesn't surprise you. Verses 3 through 6 deal with children or little ones. 
uh, as do uh, verses 10 and 14. So the whole chapter, this whole section rather, uh, deals with little ones. Also, the passage has a lot to say about stumbling blocks. We see this in verses 6 through 9. And also in 6 through 9, has a lot to say about judgment. Uh, so all of this goes together. Uh, this probably isn't a passage that we've underlined a lot in our Bibles. I don't think this is, many of us would say, Matthew 18, is, especially the, the whole chapter deals with our relationships within the body of Jesus Christ. When someone sins against us or, or uh, forgiveness, the end of the chapter deals with forgiveness. It all has to do with personal relationships. And um, I don't know about you, but I gravitate towards those passages that talk about salvation, that my sin is forgiven. This passage talks about the nuts and bolts of our personal relationships as brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, uh, in Jesus Christ, um, as children, as children. Um, with uh, so much judgment in this passage, and again, I, as you know, I just read it, with so much judgment in this passage, it's a passage that ought to get our attention. But Jesus says some very serious things uh, in these verses. It's a very important passage. If we don't understand and apply what's said, um, I believe as Christians, those who would name the name of Christ, uh, there's, there's danger involved. After the first four verses, uh, what we see is the impact of this childlike relationship with the Lord we, we see the impact of this relationship on our brothers and sisters. Um, given the fact that we're kids, and the greatness comes as being a child, how does this work itself out in our relationships with each other? We see the impact of this childlike humility. We see it particularly in verses 5, uh, five and 10. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Whoever, and verse 4, excuse me, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child, receives one such child, in my name receives me. Ultimately, this receiving of our brothers and sisters is a reception of Jesus. And the reason for this is that we're all the body of Jesus Christ. We make up the body. So when we receive each other, Ultimately, we're receiving uh, Jesus Christ. This idea of receiving is uh, the idea of welcoming. We're going to welcome our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31, it's used of the same word here, receiving, is translated welcoming. It's translated, it's used in the context of Rahab, welcoming the spies. We're to receive these little ones. We're to receive our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. We're to welcome them like they're our guests. So this is an action, this receiving, this welcoming. And then verse 10 is the other half of it to me. It's not so much action as it is attitude. Notice verse 10, see that you do not, here it is, despise one of these little ones, one of these children. And again, we're the little ones. We're the children. It's how we become great in the kingdom of heaven. We're not to despise these little ones. Literally, the word despise here means to look down on. We're not to look down on our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. We recognize that we're all who we are by grace. So why would we look down on anybody? We are, we're gifted the way we are by God's grace. And so it, it's not that it's me, it's ultimately him. The last thing we're going to do if we understand grace is look down on someone. This is, again, attitude. This is how we think or view others. Um, and ultimately, our thoughts lead to actions. We know this. What we think eventually impacts how we live. So who are these little ones whom we're to welcome and not look down on? Again, ultimately, it's anyone in the body of Jesus Christ. Truly, I say to you, this is verse 3, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. How do we get in? We, we come in so we're humble and recognize that we're sinners and run to Jesus Christ for salvation. <clears throat> now, here's the thing. Since we're told to welcome, since we're told to receive and not despise, 
Since Jesus tells us this, what, what might we guess about ourselves? These are things that are probably hard for us. And that's why we have this direction. This might not be the natural indication of our sin nature. It's likely that the, these are things we might stumble, stumble with. Um, and so we need direction. Now, how might this despising look? Again, verse 10, we're not to look down on someone. How might it look? Scripture talks about um, those uh, who might not have the finances that other people have, whose economic status isn't the same. And I think we've all struggled with this. We've all seen people on corners or the other night I was in Safeway buying ice cream and it took 15 minutes because the guy at the front of the line, and you can guess how he looked, couldn't get his money together. And you know all the awful thoughts that were running through my mind as I was waiting for this guy, uh, tying up the whole store. There were only two checkers in the store anyway and I always get the slowest line. <laughs> but here we go, James chapter two, and I read this last week, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith of, Hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, the glorious Lord, uh, glorious God. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, into your church, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in the good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not? then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts. By the way, when that guy left the store, he said, looked back at us and said, God bless you. So <laughs> there you go. But you understand what I'm saying. We can easily look down on those whose uh, financial resources aren't great. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 22. This is the Lord's Supper passage. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise, here's our word, despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I'm not going to do that, Paul says. So what are some other issues? Just this kind of... Uh, a free-for-all here, you might agree with me or you might not. I do think that we can struggle with the financial issue. Um, but other than that, um, how might we despise or look down on others and have trouble receiving others? Um, perhaps ethnic diversity. I don't know how much we struggle with this. Certainly in other parts of the country, it's a big thing. Um, I think it depends to some degree on where you were raised or where you live. Sometimes that might just be personal, personality issues, you know? <laughs> person doesn't act like we think that they should. Someone talks too much, or perhaps another person is too quiet. Uh, maybe somebody is pushy, you know, kind of look down on them, <laughs> run the other way. Uh, someone who simply loves to uh, argue. You look at the sky, what a beautiful blue sky. That's not blue, it's hazy, you know, whatever. Perhaps it's the person with a theological difference. None of us believe exactly the same thing. Maybe it's a methodological difference. Maybe, maybe our methods are different as far as the church is concerned. Maybe it's a political difference. There are things that can impact how we view brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, depending on who we are. Maybe it's a, a, a person with a job that you don't appreciate a politician, or a lawyer, or something like that. Perhaps it's the person who doesn't wear a mask. I mean, that's, that's our day, isn't it? Perhaps it's that person who never seems to hear what you say. You say it, and there's just never a connection. Or that person who is constantly frustrating you. Just the sight of them makes you want to run for the exit. <laughs> Putting things differently, there's potential to despise and not welcome anytime there are differences. It's the differences that often divide us. And sometimes they're not serious differences at all. The money issue ultimately isn't a serious issue. It's an it's a expression of God's different providence in our lives. 
has, might or might not have anything to do with our ethics, but for the most part, it, it, it's a nothing issue, and that's the point that James is making. So again, we're to receive, welcome, and accept the other children in Christ's body. This is the message today. We're to welcome, we're to receive, we're not to look down on our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. We have these words of Jesus because it's easy to get this wrong. Most of us, um, most of us have those individuals that we find easy not to receive those people that we find easy to despise, to, some, to, to look down on. So what motivation does Jesus give to move us to receive and welcome and accept? He uses two primary motivations. One is judgment. Um, we've already talked about it to some degree. We'll talk about it more. It's a prevalent theme in this chapter. It's a very sobering chapter. And the second reason we have in this passage to not despise um, our brothers and sisters or to put positively to welcome our brothers and sisters is that these little children are important to God. Our brothers and sisters are important to God. And if they're important to God, they ought to be important to us. Remember, this whole section is talking about the same issue. The idea of little ones, of children, is the theme from the very beginning of this section to the end of the section. So as we grapple with the judgment sections, we understand that Jesus is still dealing with our response to those we're not naturally attracted to because of differences, because of distinctions. We saw this last week in verse 6, causing a little one to stumble. It's translated sin in the ESV. is worse than having a great millstone the kind of millstone that was pulled by a donkey, tied around one's neck, and drowned in the depths of the sea. Now, that is a sobering thought, isn't it? It's more important. It would be better, let's put it that way, it would be better to have the millstone and tossed into the sea than to cause a brother or sister to stumble. In the context, the sin, the stumbling block, in the context of this passage, would be the lack of receiving Again, something that Jesus just commanded in this text, someone in the church. Lack of receiving, looking down on a brother or sister. They would stumble because they don't sense that they're part of the body of Christ. They would sense the disconnection. So Jesus is saying that it would be better to die in this awful, dreadful way, right? This is an awful, dreadful way than it would be to snub a believer, Again, a very, very sobering text. Jesus continues this judgment theme. He wants to be very, very clear about this issue. He doesn't give us any wiggle room with this particular issue. Verse 7, Jesus says that given the nature of this fallen world, stumbling blocks come. Our world is filled with stumbling blocks. We face them all the time. This is why in James chapter 3, verse 2, this is part of the reason why James writes in James chapter 3, verse 2, we all stumble in many ways. We all stumble. One of the reasons is because our world is filled with stumbling blocks. To some degree, we should expect this from our fallen world. Then Jesus says, woe to the person by whom temptation, stumbling blocks come. This is verse 7. You and I passionately want to avoid the experience of woe, right? We don't, want woe. we don't want to experience woe. Woe to the world for temptations come, for it is necessary that temptations come. It's a broken world. But woe to the one by whom the temptation, the stumbling block comes. And you see where he's going here. He's worried about brothers and sisters being stumbling blocks to other brothers and sisters. And so he uses this word woe. It means, when you see the word woe, it means disaster is coming. Woe is me, you remember the line in Isaiah 6, I am undone. In the face of the sovereign God and his own sin, Isaiah understood that things weren't going to go well. As we interpret 8 and 9, again, we need to remember the context, the sin, the stumbling block, in this context, 
is not welcoming a fellow believer. That's what the text is all about. Receiving brothers and sisters and not looking down on them. So when he deals with this sin in verses 8 and 9, that's the issue that he's talking about. We can become stumbling blocks if we don't receive brothers and sisters and if we look down on brothers and sisters. The implicit thought in 7 through 9 is that we need to make sure we're not the stumbling block the temptation that, that uh, might uh, make a person go astray. If I'm a stumbling block to you, you might say, wow, <laughs> maybe this Christianity doesn't change a person's life. Maybe there is no um, uh, proper re- relationship. If this guy doesn't obey the word, maybe it's not true. As we saw in Matthew 5, and again, the, the background, uh, I mean, uh, the, the judgment in this text is clear. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw away. Cut it off and throw it away. It is better to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It would be better for you to enter life with one eye uh, than with two eyes to be thrown uh, into, uh, into the hell of fire. Um, as we saw this same sort of reasoning in Matthew chapter 5, remember Jesus dealing with lust, we understood that this was hyperbole. Obviously, we don't cut off our hands, we don't cut off our feet, we don't gouge out our eyes. But what Jesus is saying is that what we do do is we radically deal with sin. We take sin very seriously, especially this sin. What's at stake? And again, look at the end of verses 8 and 9. Eternal fire and into the hell of fire. What's at stake? If we don't get this right, and that's why I say this passage is so important, what's at stake is eternal, incomprehensible judgment. Remember, the millstone is preferable than being a stumbling block, than to be a stumbling block to a brother or sister. Now, you might be thinking, I thought we were saved by grace through faith. You might be thinking of the gospel, and indeed, you'd be right. But faith in Jesus changes our lives. We turn from our sin, and we follow him. The indication that we have faith in Jesus is that we live a changed life. Our lives are different. Jesus is saying that feet that walk away. And and so, again, we have the the hands mentioned, the feet mentioned, and the eyes. And so what's he getting at here? When he talks about uh, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, causes you to stumble so that you cause someone else to stumble. What he's basically saying is that we can do things with our feet. We can walk in a particular direction. We can walk towards somebody. We can walk away from somebody. And when we do that, we can either affirm them as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, or we can uh, discount who they are, again, by what we do with our feet. We can do the same thing with our hands. We can serve certain people. We can affirm the fact that they're brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, or we can do things with our hands that say something that's completely different. I'm not going to serve you. I don't care about you. And then how about our eyes? The same thing. What we do with our eyes says a great deal. Um, I'm reminded of uh, Proverbs 21, verse 4. Haughty eyes and a proud heart, the lamp of the wicked, are sin. I fear that we've all given proud, despising looks from time to time. You guys might have. I never have, right? (laughs) Yeah, we've all done that. Jesus is saying that we must deal radically with our our despising, unwelcoming behavior. So we've seen we've seen the judgment that Jesus, that that this brings. This is why we guard our lives passionately in this particular area. We receive our brothers and sisters, we welcome them, and we do not look down on them because otherwise we become stumbling blocks that bring judgment. So we've seen the judgment. Now we need to see, and this will be the last thing we look at, how important our brothers and sisters are uh, to Christ. First of all, verse 10, very difficult verse. Uh, believers, spiritual children, 
Um, little ones have angelic representatives in heaven. I'm not going to give you a satisfactory answer. I'm telling you that at, uh, at the beginning. The verse doesn't seem to be saying that we have guardian angels. It doesn't say that necessarily. Perhaps that's an inference, but it certainly doesn't clearly say that. I think it's saying that we have a guardian father whom the angels report to. That's where I would go with this. Angels have access to God. I'm not exactly sure what's being said, but I think it's getting at the, at the idea that these people whom we despise are important to God. They might not be important to me, they might not be important to you, but they're important to God. If we love God, we're going to love those whom he loves. And again, this still might be related to judgment. I'm not exactly sure what to do with this verse. It could be related. I mean, who wants angels after you, right? I mean, perhaps that's the thought. Finally, in 12 through 14, we see how important these little ones are to God. If one goes astray, if one stumbles, God will track the lost sheep down, that lost sheep, and bring it home. The last thing we want to do is cause, here it is, God's sheep to stumble. We don't want him cleaning up our messes in this sense. It's not God's will that he lose any of his sheep. Now, a quick sidebar. What a comfort this truth is, isn't it? This is talking about sheep, those who have relationship with Jesus Christ. There's another, I believe it's Luke 18, where he, Jesus basically uses the same parable. There he's talking about the lost. Here he's talking about believers. Um, we all stumble in many ways. Isn't it wonderful that our God doesn't want any of his sheep to perish? He doesn't want any of his sheep to perish. He will track us down and bring us home. The reason the reason you are in church today is because he's gone and found you after you've wandered into sin. Isn't that just glorious truth? The reason we're here is because God has graciously drawn us back to, to himself. If we understand God's love for us, it seems that we'll love his other sheep. How do we welcome, just kind of a, a couple of practical thoughts as we finish, how do we welcome and not despise God's sheep? Remember that we're all children deserving God's wrath, apart from grace. Remember God's grace. Remember verse 3, we turn and become like children. God has welcomed you into his family. He's your caring father who will track you down if you go astray. We want to do what we can to keep others from going astray. My thought here is simple. Perhaps I wasn't clear. As we understand his grace, his amazing grace, that grace will move us to be gracious. The evidence of grace in my life is that I'm gracious towards my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And then second, first we understand grace, but the other part of this, we, um, we welcome and not look down on the children of God, as we remember how seriously God takes this issue. He takes it very seriously. Remember, drowning with a great millstone is preferable to causing a little one to stumble. And stumble in this text means not receiving, not welcoming, or looking down. I'll end with verse 4. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this text. I feel like we've rushed through it, um, and yet it's, it's such a valuable text that we all need to take to heart. Father, um, help us to see your grace, grace that enables us to be humble, grace that enables us to um, receive our brothers and sisters, even if we don't agree about everything, even if there are personality issues, or other frustrations, grace that causes us not to look down on others because we realize that as we look down on others, we see ourselves. It's your grace that changes us. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would the men come? Uh, Doug and Wayne are going to help with the Lord's Supper. So I trust you all have cups. 
Uh, just one thought as we come to the Lord's Supper. And that is, um, we remember, obviously, this is a time to remember the work of Jesus Christ. Uh, do this in remembrance of me. But I want to say this remembrance thing is bigger than just remembering his death. It's remembering um, the promises of God. It's remembering eternal life. It's, it's, more than just, it's more than just his death. It's remembering what his death secured for us and all the blessings that are ours because of his work. It's interesting to me that I, I think it's in the book of, uh, it, it is in, in Ezra, uh, Ezra um, Ezekiel. I don't remember what verse, but it talks about celebrating Passover. So often when we come to the supper, it's a time of introspection. And it should be that to some degree. We need to make sure that we're not despising our brothers and sisters. But it's more than just introspection. More than, it's, it's way more. It's, it's, it's looking out. Ultimately, it's a time of celebration as we consider the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ, but ultimately the promise of heaven that's ours through his work. So obviously, we're mindful of our sin. We look to Jesus and his death, but we also celebrate all the glorious uh, truth that is ours through his work. Brother Doug. Heavenly Father, um, I just uh, praise you. We, we thank you for all your blessings, and we are blessed, and we give God the glory for that. And um, I just want to uh, um, thank you um, um, for uh, the chance to come to this communion table and what it represents. Um, um, Jesus paying the, the ultimate price uh, for us so that we might live. And I want to thank you for the bread and what it represents, his body broken for us. And again, I just thank you, praise you, and love you in Jesus' name. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. Brother Wayne, would you thank the Lord for the cup, please? Our Father in heaven, this is a special time. We come together as believers, those that have put their trust in our Lord Jesus Christ. A reminder of the great sacrifice that was made on our behalf. No greater love than that that the Lord had for each one of us. As his blood was shed on the cross, we were reminded that this blood is a blood that cleanses sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So we're thankful as we remember exactly what took place on that day and are so thankful that our Lord was willing to make that sacrifice. As we drink this cup, we are again drawn close to our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for their forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Thank you, gentlemen. Brother Ora.
Thank you, Lord, for a convicting word. Please stand with us as we do thank the Lord. keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory majesty dominion and authority before all time now and forevermore amen, amen. Lord bless have a blessed Lord's Day amen. Next week? You on next week? Yes. Yes. All righty. I'll make sure you get the song. I, I'm, I'm past now needing a reminder, I guess. You never know about me, but... <laughs> yeah, well, the other thing is um, uh, I bring a book anyway. So if we had to, we'd have, you'd make copies, but it's better if I hear... You know, <laughs> so yeah, that's good. Good, 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 good. Do it. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. You want flowers? Bunny, chestnut, rotten.
Yep, yep, yep. 